because uh, this is a free and open space and everyone's moving in and out. I am actually going to do a little karakia, a prayer to start with. Uh, I will say it's to the Creator. In Maori, it would be to Atua, the God. It's whatever you want to believe in. So this is just to make this space sacred for us for now and to thank the Ohoni and other peoples who've been here. So however you want to observe that, that's what we're going <laughs> to do first, okay? So it goes like this. E te ariki, pakorongoai ra kia mato. E te ariki, titi rumai ra kia mato. Te ne mato tamariki, ito te pono ana mato ki a koe. Oh, e. And creator, please make the Wi-Fi work. <laughs> so we are very lucky today. We are beaming in from Canada, Andy Morrow and Tara Bagan, because the technology is working so well right now. We're actually going to cut right to them because I'm really here to just do a shout out for as many indigenous artists, activists who are doing their thing, right? <laughs> so <laughs> there they are. These guys are on holiday and they took time off from their holiday. So round of applause for them taking time off from their holiday. And they are the co-creators and makers of a company called Article 11. Why did you call yourselves Article 11? Uh, the 11th article of the... That's you. Oh, that sounds crazy. <laughs> um, okay, so the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People uh, was adopted around the world when it was uh, offered up in September 2007 by every nation except uh, United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand opted out. So everywhere where there are really vocal and artistically vibrant Indigenous peoples, and of course we're everywhere, but there's um, seem to be sort of more of a distinct and um, sidelined Indigenous societies in those four countries, uh, was rejected. Um, so in the 11th article of the UNDRIPS, it states that Indigenous people have a right to their to our cultures, arts, um, history, artifacts, traditions, uh, not only those that are existing, but also to move them into the contemporary, into our own way of practicing, and to have the resources to be able to do so. So we felt like it would be an interesting thing to name our company after something that is such a basic human right. Um, and it also opens up, we believe, the, the doorway into the conversation that is happening quite a bit in um, Canada, which is this notion of a term called cultural genocide. It's like, it's like qualifying the word rape, you know, brutal rape, when is it not? Um, genocide is genocide. When it's cultural, it's just a means to an end in a, in a slightly more polite way. So, um, so yeah, our, our every waking moment is kind of about <laughs> fighting the fight and making art that we feel like we can be proud of and that our ancestors can be proud of and that our Andy's kid and my niece and nephew and all the ones to come will be proud of and so that when they have to work when they're doing their own work it's not going to be as difficult for them so what tell us about some of the work you've been making i think on facebook you said you've worked on five to seven shows this year <laughs> you're flying across the nations all the time so tell us about some of the work you're really proud of let me start with reckoning you start with reckoning you start <laughs> well, the most recent thing we did was in Montreal, a piece called Reckoning, which um, Tara started writing a long time ago and um, sidelined it for a while because it was so personal for her. Um, and then once we really kind of uh, engendered ourselves as Article 11 and started to have the resources to develop, we worked on a piece called Reckoning, which is about the very current and not just in Canada, but other parts of the world where there is a kind of a reconciliation process happening or attempted. So here um, there's this quite... Uh, quite branded process um, begun by the government to sort of 
unearth the traumas of the period of time that many of you may know about, which is the, uh, the residential school system and those children that were taken, uh, were literally plucked out of their communities and away from their families. Oftentimes families not even knowing where they went or for how long and the kids certainly not knowing where they were um, and raised to be white basically. And it was, uh, it was an established policy of the Canadian government to, um, it was acknowledged by our first prime minister that, um, you know, despite all the education efforts, if a child remains with his or her family, they will therefore, they will thereby remain a savage. So that's why those residential schools were created to take the children away from their families and fully enculturate them to Christianity and sort of the way, way of living. So anyway, this piece is about a very current um, fallout from that process, the truth and reconciliation, which is acknowledging what the government did but not necessarily taking care of those who have to relive that trauma and exist within the all out in the community. So that's the most recent piece we did. We just did Montreal with a great group of artists. What do we do? Uh, uh, so that's a, that's a triptych piece. It works with um, dance and it's scored to text from official documents from the Truth and Reconciliation hearings adjudicators. So the people who worked and, and bore witness to these the tellings of these heinous crimes that were perpetrated against children. So that the first piece is a, a dance to that to that text. That one is a very realistic two-hander. And the third is a monologue scored with video. So it's a by nature is multidisciplinary. And I think that's um, you know, this conversation comes up often like, what is Canadian theater? What is indigenous theater? And I think when it comes to indigenous theater, I think it is a desire and a proficiency with multiple disciplines that necessarily get woven together to tell stories that are very specific, but that also branch out to be to other people and hopefully people who inhabit indigenous land. So that was just adding to what you said. <laughs> so we're talking- um, We've been bound to- uh, Go ahead, David. I was just saying, we're talking to dramaturgs here. So when it comes to indigenous dramaturgy, I know you actually coined the term, Andy, design turgy as well. Do you have a mm -hmm. kind of way that you work that you could share or a way that people who are non-Indigenous can work with Indigenous artists as dramaturgs? Can you start that? Yeah, it's, um, we really appreciate that for sure, for sure the, uh, the rehearsal standards and the way that funding is supporting the rehearsal standards in Canada um, is contrary to what we believe is really effective, which is being able to be up in space and on our feet as soon as possible and um, asking the actors to get as familiar with the text as they can as soon as possible, working with design from day one. So for me, as a, as a playwright, which is probably how I spend most of my time um, when I'm working, is writing, my writing became more possible when I saw Andy's work as a designer. So when I'm conceiving of a piece, I'm right away considering the reality that, that nobody's going to say that this is impossible or this can't be done, or we could never have the budget to do that because Andy's skill and capabilities are such that it feels like I can just write whatever I want and imagine it all into being and then <laughs> he will make it so. So I'm pretty lucky that way. Um, so what we do is, uh, for example, I guess the most recent play that I wrote, I wrote a play in February that I've been, it's been steeping for a long time, but I actually typed it out in February at the, at the Bant Colony. I don't know if Brian's there, but hi, Brian. Hi, Jenna, if you're there. <laughs> Brian is here. Um, Brian is there. in the house. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so I was writing not at all what I was invited to write there, but Brian was very supportive of that. It's um, a vengeance play called Dear Woman, and it's... Um, it's basically an ode to survivors of, um, some of you may not know that in, in Canada, there is a real epidemic of our indigenous women and girls being uh, murdered, abducted and trafficked. Uh, the works, it's, it's, in, it's in a bad way and it's quite contrary to the, we're so polite, oh gosh, we're pretty nice, a eh? reputation that Canada likes to propagate. So, so we try to talk about that as much as we can um, this piece was, uh, it's a solo performer piece and Andy and I immediately started speaking about, uh, if it's called Dear Woman, and I, we picture very clearly this, this strong, um, 
uh, frankly, large bodied indigenous women with the presence of antlers everywhere. So if we're, if we're seeing a female human talking about feeling like she has antlers, what does that mean? If, if the male of, of the deer is the one who has antlers, what does it mean when a woman feels she has antlers? So we quickly realized that the character is two spirited um, and that, that there will be a presence that is probably mostly um, encircling her through projection that, that, that shifts as she speaks the story. And the more she reveals her weapons that she uh, butchers a, a man with, um, the more those weapons kind of weave into the, the videoscape of antlers. So right away, Andy and I talk about what that what the piece might look like. And usually early on, we know if it's an Article 11 show or not, and we feel like this one is. So as soon as I came close to a draft, we had a long drive and um, I read the whole thing to him. And then we spoke about what what we saw, what we felt, what we heard, why we, we agreed that we feel like somehow the stage moves. We don't know to what degree. So right off the get go, we work with the space that the storyteller, the actor will be telling the story with, with the rest of us and how do we make that happen? And even as, as kind of gross as it seems, thinking about how we will frame that in grant applications so that people don't think we're doing something extraordinary luxurious but that it's actually something that will enrich the work from the beginning so that it's a stronger piece that can um, get to its realization early okay so one of the big things, I think if things they have here we're talking about art and activism like as a cross-section between those things do you even see that there is uh, two different things or do when you say an article 11 show or not and lumping into that, the celebrating of Canada 150, I saw your article on Spiderweb Show with the upside down maple leaf. So how do you frame activism in your art? Can we see Jesse's voice here? Yeah, I want to quote Jesse on that. So, you know, we did a piece <laughs> that we called Declaration, which is a performative installation piece that you know, one of the one of the biggest shortcuts we have to that what we're sort of defining as design liturgy and that collaborative way of working and what makes it indigenous is that we make sure that we're in an indigenous environment and that we are speaking to each other. I mean, we're sort of the shortcut is when you can create a team or assemble a team that already knows the base language, which isn't English or physical or anything. It's just like we know what the, we know how to approach story already. So yeah, Tara and I have an advantage in terms of spending every second of our time together. But but when you create a team that has that common understanding of what story is, that's a way that the, all of the elements can come into the room simultaneously. And I'm talking physical and metaphysical layers that you can just grab together. So um, the, the what you know the reason I said that is because we did a piece called um, Declaration, or it's a it's a recurring piece that molds itself to wherever we are, whatever territory we're in and whatever artists we're working with. And one of them we did with um, a great thinker and theorist and uh, cultural commentator named Jesse Wente. And uh, he was addressing the fact that one of the people we were working with uh, had to uh, deal with somebody's question, uh, which was, why is your work always so political? You know, as indigenous First Nations work, why is it always so political? And, and you know, Jesse Wente framed that in a way that we are all so grateful for, which was that by nature of uh, our existence, the work that we create is political. And we didn't make it political. It's colonialism that made what we do political. We were creating work and making culture and singing and dancing before anybody else was here. So it's the arrival of that kind of thought and that uh, imposed structure that makes our very existence political. So in that way, yeah, art and activism are inseparable just by virtue of the fact that we're here and we're making it. Um, we still pine for the time when, um, you know, indigenous performers can be doctors and cops and teachers without being prostitutes and drug addicts and abusers, you know, so we're waiting for that to happen. That's another side of how work becomes politicized. But in terms of the creation of it, it is by its nature political, whether we want to write a musical about peanut butter or talk about people have fault may have because the reason I say that is because the phone is actually balancing on a peanut butter jar right now, just so you know. That's what we're doing. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so we want to start conversations. I wonder if anyone has any questions for them. We're going to have, if anyone's got any questions, because we are going to do some other things in this session. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? Your hand is going up, Vivian. Okay. Um, hey, so, hi, uh, my name is um, Vivian Chase, and I'm a um, non-binary dramaturg from the East Coast. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, a lot of my work is focused on the dramaturgy of um, direct action and other similar political interventions, and I understand that performativity and theater is a major part of um, indigenous organizing in, in Canada, and I'm interested if you might talk about your experience and the way those things are integrated and how the um, perform sort of performative culture of a lot of the um, nations existing pipelines, for example, influences the theater community and what that relationship is. Yeah, that's the mm -hmm. Oh my God, we could only kind of catch every other word of that. Is there some way, can somebody maybe type the question? The or mic was just cutting in and out. Or even Dave, you seem to hear David better. Maybe he can paraphrase somehow. I think the thing was about, you are talking about non-binary things and two-spirited theater as well and also pipeline sorry i'm having trouble uh, i would say just put the mic closer hey uh sorry about that um can you hear me better now is this is this better no it's still not working guys okay. are those two different mics i don't know um it's no we can't i'm sorry sorry Oh, <laughs> so awful. It's terrible. We want to hear. The relationship between performative culture and political organizing. That is the question. I think it's kind of what we just said. Huh. Performative culture and political organizing. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know more? Any, um, I don't have any great thoughts about that, except that um, recently, Andy always does this thing where... <laughs> When he comes out of the shower, he has these big thoughts. So sometimes when he showers, I just go in there and sit and hang out and listen to him say things. But anyway, <laughs> about a week ago. <laughs> That's a secret, everyone. About a week ago, uh, when we were still in Montreal, Andy came out of the shower and he <laughs> said, do you believe that thoughts and intentions can actually change the world in a larger scale? Which, of course, is what we ask ourselves all the time doing this work uh, and in history. And, but I really, it was a good reminder because we were very tired as we all always are. We're fucking underfunded as we all always are. And we were just feeling really weighted by that. And fortunately, Andy came out with this lovely shower thought. And it made me realize that, yes, of course, like I, I do believe that intention and speaking a thing. And the more that people hear the thing, the more that you will affect change. It's slow as hell. But I think that if we are, if in our performance, we, uh, for example, Jonathan Fisher in Reckoning, we, we created this piece specifically for this brilliant actor, Jonathan Fisher. And he stands up there and he speaks to, um, he's, he's videoing um, a suicide message to his community. And he takes a moment and speaks how he believes because of residential school, none of his goodness could live inside his body and thrive. And he believes that he put that his goodness into his nephew and in there he could see what was good about him and nurture that. And he believed that that goodness will carry through in his nephew's life. And there, there are many um, nations, including mine, the Lukakmuk people, who believe that the avuncular relationship is important and more so than, than sometimes a fatherly one. <laughs> because you can guarantee that you're related to your nephew, but you can't guarantee that your son is yours, right? So um, as funny as that is, um, <laughs> an uncle is in many ways, I mean, an uncle is, is closer to you in some ways. So the truth in that and the, the sending that feeling out into the world and um, ourselves having a nephew whose father isn't able to be present the way that maybe he should be, maybe that message will go out and there will be children who feel and understand that the the direct you know father father mother relationship thing doesn't have to be the be all and end all it can be 
your uncle who's also your auntie, or it can be your uncle who feels like a mother to you, or whatever that is. The, the creativity in what immediate family can be, I think, is something that through the arts, we can affect that change. I don't know if this is at all addressing your question. I'm so sorry, but it's just the thing that popped into my mind. Does anyone um, have but any I other feel questions? like if we, Put your hand if up. we speak yes. these things, oh, is there another, is there a clarifying remark? I don't, or? I don't see any other questions, but I was going to say on the performative aspect, about I Don't Know More, when I went back and it was researching political activism and the things that have flowed, the truth and reconciliation, I, it dawned on me again how powerful I Don't Know More was and that just uh -huh. going on to the streets with your drum and marching really made a difference and changed people's minds and also galvanized political action for the future. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Go ahead. Uh, my th my thinking is that I think in many ways it started it started to spread an understanding of non-indigenous people that indigenous cultures and stories are relevant to them and are also include them because it wasn't a case of choosing to go to a powwow or choosing to go to ceremony it was there when you were running out to the mall after work or whatever it was so the kind of I guess, ubiquity of, of Indigenous voices at that time, I think strengthened the understanding that we're responsible for each other and maybe started to just kind of grow empathy in non-Indigenous people for, for the reality that Indigenous history is everybody's who lives here. I think that that helped. And there's something connected, David, I'm not sure exactly how directly, but there's something about the way that for us and for Indigenous nations everywhere, performance isn't as authoritative as it is in the Western world and the way it's so closely related to religion or the, you know, the sort of the architecture of a church or that environment where there are spectators and spectated, you know, we know that our histories include a much more inclusive kind of performative storytelling experiential relationship. So in a lot of ways, you know, sort of the, the desperation of movements like I don't know more, is the purest way that we can bring that kind of storytelling into this society just because it has to happen right now. So you get out there with the tools you have and you tell that story, <clears throat> you know? So I, I think that's the interesting game that we play with um, trying to work the way we do and have this kind of performative dramaturgical politicization uh, in a medium that is very Western. You know, how do we push those boundaries uh, internally into how we create the work and then how it is communicated and received in a way that doesn't become, for lack of a better term, a minstrel show, you know, and that's the big, that's the challenge in terms of making work that is inherently indigenous in a, in a, in a nature of, of performative relationship that isn't. That's, that to me is, is a big part of why I don't know more is by nature political and performative and what we all strive to create and in, in how we do the work we do, if that makes sense. Okay, I think we Does might answer the question? leave you guys, but you can stay online and maybe join in the discussion after, if, or you can go back to your holiday. It's your choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So can we have a big round of applause for Andy and Tara? <laughs> Thank you. David, love you. <laughs> I love you too. Kia ora. Okay, so now we are going to, can we put that on the full screen, please? Indigenous art activism. So, due to the lights, I don't know if you can see that, we don't cross your borders, your borders cross us. One of the things I was trying to do when I put this together was that we don't really think about Canada and America so much. We think about our nations that have been there for 10,000 years and longer. So the other thing was I thought I'd put a totem pole up there because most of you know what that is, right? Next slide. And one of the things I can do to try and say what activism is, I would say this guy Dylan Robinson wrote a really great thing on welcoming sovereignty, which was when you come to a totem pole, think of it like a border station. Think about you are crossing into someone else's land. 
Think about all the things that would happen to you when you went from the US to the Canadian border. They would say, what is your intention? Why are you coming here? What's in your bags? Have you got anything dangerous? How long are you coming for? Are you coming on holiday or are you coming to live? What are you going to do when you come here to contribute? Right? That is a really different way to think about a totem pole, right? Totem poles were created for many different reasons. But this guy really made me go, oh, that's a really different way to make your brain think something new, right? From something that we often just go, oh, it's a totem pole. They get reduced to toothpick holders, right? Souvenirs from Canada. Next screen, please. I'm going to go through the PowerPoint I had very quickly because I want you to be able to have some questions. And uh, this is uh, someone I would have liked to Skype in. His name is Ty Defoe. He is a really amazing artist. And a prayer in motion was something he talked about in dance. And he does the hoop dance. And if we had time, we would go to his link where he talks about it. But here, there is actually a two-spirited powwow. So you could all go to that, right? People are saying, oh, how can we get indigenous people into the theatre? How about we start going out and going, what are they making? What can we enter into? It's a very open thing, and it's very new. Okay, so next slide. Uh, the other thing I do wanted to do was say that a lot of people have honoured the nations we're on, we're here. I actually found a documentary made about the Ohoni Nation, and it talked about the shell mounds, which are just down here, and the mall that was built on top of them, the bodies uh, that were dug up. There was uh, a whole lot of bars there. There was a paint factory. Eventually, they said, well, yeah, but a mall is more important. So that is what is built there, right? I don't know what the banquet uh, marina was built on, but when you come to a new nation, like I say, you think about the place that you're going, and you do some research into the local people and you remember in Vancouver, we actually got someone from the nation to welcome us to the place. So I'm not saying it was easy to find someone, but that would be the start of a relationship with the people who were here, okay? So next slide. Can you re read that? So I teach uh, indigenous screenwriting in Capilano University in Vancouver. So one of the things I do is I, and I teach uh, non-indigenous students too, I use this film, Real Engine by Neil Diamond. How many people have seen this film? It's a fantastic film for locating how the stereotypes were made by Hollywood. You can't really talk about theater without talking about film because film created all the stereotypes. And this is actually a really good research paper, too. It's designed like a research paper. You could incorporate it into your university structure very well. He has an objective to work out how the Hollywood Indian was created. He goes on a journey. He uses different methodologies to work out. He does some ethnographic research. He does an experiment. And then he comes to a conclusion. And one of the big conclusions is that Zacharias Kunick and director of the Adelinjit Fast Runner is the way we should be making film. He is one of the most prominent film directors. Okay, next slide. And I thought I'd put Moana up there for Ken. I love Moana. And it passes the Bechdel test. So Moana is a great response to Pocahontas because there was a lot of activism about what Pocahontas was and wasn't. And I actually brought along uh, The Inconvenient Indian by Thomas King. How many people have read this book? Okay, so this is the set text. He actually does this great thing. He actually researches uh, John Smith and Pocahontas. Jo John Smith actually made up that story three times about three different places he went to. That he was befriended by a local girl, that they wanted to kill him, and that she saved his life. He actually told that story three times before he told it here. He didn't meet Pocahontas until he was in England, probably, and he was a lot older, but it's a story that pervades, right? and she's sexualized, and she needs him. So next slide. Oh. So Haka with Standing Rock, if you're on Facebook, you should like this page. 
when people ask me about what are Maori doing, what the Dakota Sioux did was they said, we want the indigenous people of the world to support us. And they particularly asked Maori. So a guy, Timohawa, Shane Nakora, went on Facebook and he wrote a haka, which you will probably translate and I could translate as a war challenge. But this was a political challenge and he said, do it however you like. So not many people actually did it, but they created their own haka and they put them on YouTube. So there's a ton of these and there's all over Maori, all over the world, bid them and posted them. And here are some people on a beach in New Zealand doing one across to the Standing Rock. And they actually just broke the world record in New Zealand, 7,700 people doing the haka together after a rugby game. That's one of our most powerful things when I was doing this, dancing actually was the thing that I was going, oh actually, dance comes more natural to indigenous people. I think because we just do it from when we're kids. Okay, next slide. Children of God has uh, been talked about yesterday. I wanted to just do a shout out to the NAC for programming it, but also Kevin Loring is the figure in the front. He just became the creative director for the Indigenous Theatre, which has just started at DIC. I would show you the link, but we haven't got time, so we're gonna just going to race through these now. I wanted to include a bit of sport because there is a big performative element for indigenous people in sport because we often end up playing sport because we're big and strong and we end up playing rugby or we end up playing different sports. This guy on the left is uh, Adam Goods. He won Australia in the year. He's an Aboriginal. He was playing a game in Australia and a girl in the stand called him an ape. So he stopped the game and he got her kicked out of the stadium. Next time he started playing, people started booing him, and so he did an Aboriginal war dance during the game, which caused an enormous amount of controversy. You can re look at the link. And I thought I'd put up Colin Kaepernick too, because that is a ritual performance that he did. While everyone else was going on the stand-up, he took a knee, right? He actually just made a huge statement on Twitter about the police state. He donated $50,000 to Standing Rock Health Clinic. So that's one of the big things about access is that we actually need money to make things happen and we need people to stand up. Okay, next. Uh, this is Tama Iti. This is actually his Twitter handle. Tama Iti is a two who we know as many things, activist, artist, terrorist, and cyclist. Living in the heart of two Tūhoi Nation, we were having a treaty uh, settlement ceremony in New Zealand and he shot the New Zealand flag with a shotgun. He wasn't charged, he was warned about uh, firearm scenes. He is a prominent artist, he's a very big language advocate. He was then, a few years after that, rounded up in a terrorist raid and he ended up going to prison for nine months. So he is the kind of a face of Maori activism that you could look up. Some people in Maoridom don't think he goes too far, but he's definitely out there doing it. Okay, next slide. I wanted to conclude this one just to acknowledge all the nations that are here and all the different languages, because I wanted to move on to language next. Uh, how many people know what the Welsh knot is? Often people think that colonial powers suppressing uh, language was just something that happened to indigenous people. The Welsh knot was given to someone who spoke Welsh when the British said don't, and it was handed to the next person who spoke Welsh during the day. You just kept on handing it on until it landed on you, and then you got beat up. That's how they stopped people speaking Welsh. They translated that over to any indigenous community they found. Next slide. You can't read that. That's uh, a lot of the figures about language things. Let's keep going because it's impossible to read. Uh, this one you can vaguely read. Uh, often people talk about extinct animals. In indigenous communities, we often talk about languages being extinct. It's actually, on there's 40% of the indigenous languages of the world are endangered. 
as opposed to other animals. So a lot of indigenous activism is about trying to get language retained. Next slide. I was going to talk about drama too, because it's such an English word, <laughs> German word. I often go, what is another way of phrasing that in the indigenous world? I call myself a story shapeshifter. Next slide. And can you read that? So I'm going to ask you now to think about all the things you can do. Witness, honor, advocate, and become allies, but not, it should say, not appropriate, not no appropriate. Build relationships, practice reciprocity, adapt Sherman Alexi. Like, I was thinking, what could a non-Indigenous dramaturg do? Well, you have amazing non-Indigenous writers whose work is waiting to be translated to the stage. Sherman Alexi is just, like, outstanding, right? So why not, as a dramaturg, go, I want to enter into a project where we adapt his work for the stage and we take it to reservations or reserves, right? Often the access for people who live on reserve and reservations is they don't get to the theatre, it's too far. Next, please. And when I'm working with Indigenous dramaturgy, I practice the land acknowledgement. Smudging is a big thing. Trying to make a space Indigenous, even if you're not being able to go to somewhere else. Because people, how many people know what smudging is? Like, there's a big debate in Canada about that because theatres got worried about it and said you can't smoke dope in there. Do we? It's not, we're not smoking dope, right? We're doing a sacred ceremony. So the, this thing of education, um, engaging elders is something that I think every organization should be trying to do. Universities, LMDA, we need to honor the idea that our elders have wisdom and that we can learn from conversations with them. Uh, I'm going to the F word now. Next player. So can you see that? Jimi Hendrix up there doing feedback. You should have David Mamet down the corner going, fuck you, I'm not, you no feedback. But we've talked a lot about feedback sessions, right? That's what's hard for a lot of indigenous audiences, I think, is that they're not in a conversation, they're being kept in the dark for two hours and then asked to turn on their cell phones and then tweet, right? People want to come and have a conversation. And that is why theatre designed around having conversations can be more powerful. Next slide. Okay, so I put on a whole lot of artists. How much time have we got? Almost an hour left. Wow, this is great, because we'll be able to break out and we'll be able to do some of this, okay? Okay, so I also looked at fine artists. Can you see that? This guy, Brian Jungen, actually made totem poles out of golf bags. And he made traditional, traditional, modern masks out of Air Nikes. Next one. These guys are fish farmers. Next one. And I wanted to showcase a woman called Rebecca Belmore. How many people have heard of Rebecca Belmore? So she has done a lot of great activism art in Canada. Next slide. She also did a piece with Paul Wong called Vigil 5.4, and I'm not sure, do you think this would play? Okay, so we're going to try and play this, because I think in terms of... Uh, So just a short piece, but it's pretty powerful. And it's based on the murder of a missing woman. And for Canadians, this is one of the big educations that is very powerful and unsettling. That it's not all Mounties and maple syrup. 
In fact, the Mounties are the ones who've been looking the wrong way sometimes and sometimes participating in it. So this has been a very tough way to start a conversation, but she is an amazing artist that I would say check out. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple more of her pieces, so you can just scroll through. These are some stills from the piece. Keep going. And she wrote the names of missing women on her arm there, you can see, and she actually yells them out in the performance. Uh, next one. Next. And if you want a great image for 150 years of Canada, there it is. Next. Oh, that one's hard to see. She's hanging upside down in a thing. Next. And this would be another one that speaks to residential school, the cutting of hair, right? Next. Okay, so this is actually a play that I was the dramaturg for during some of the iterations of it. It's called Red Patch. It's actually based in the First World War. It's about an indigenous soldier going to fight for the Canadian Army. To do that, you would actually lose your status. So it was, And sometimes if you came back, the white soldiers would get land, and they would find, and as a native soldier, you would get nothing. In fact, you would find that the guys you were fighting with would have got your land. So that's a very tough thing to happen. And uh, Race Calvert and Sean Oliver are young writers, and one of the things I was particularly strong with them was that they needed to go back to the nation that Race came from and spend time there and actually find people who could guide him through it. So my job as a dramaturg was actually to try and channel him in the right direction. He was very frightened. Possibly because they might say, no, you can't do that. You don't know enough. In fact, they opened their arms to him. They said, thank God. Yes, we would love you to put our language in the play. We would love to teach it to you. We've been waiting so long for someone to listen to us. And that was a very powerful thing as for him as a young artist to go, oh, people have been waiting a long time for someone to say, I want to help. I want to listen to you, and I want to help tell your story. Next one. And one of the things, again, that I would say in my Indigenous dramaturgy we talked about was trying to get traditional forms into modern. And this was particularly with masks, because the Northwest Pacific Coast has a lot of amazing masks. If you go to Vancouver, the airport, there's transformation masks and dancing using masks. So it was to try and put masks into the show in whatever form that was, to do lots of research about masks. And some are sacred, you can't use them, of course. And some dances you can't use. But how can we modernize a traditional form? Okay, next. Ah, this one Laurel knows about. Where's Laurel? Come up here, Laurel. So Laurel Green is helping me with this presentation. And I wanted to say that education was one of the biggest things that has changed in Canada. The cur new curriculum is quite strongly indigenous orientated like I'm really happy about that and there are theater companies doing really amazing work so maybe you'd like to talk about this um, I'm talking about this as an enthusiast audience member and uh, supporter of this project um, I was not involved with it directly but it has impacted my community so I am uh, living in Calgary which is Treaty 7 territory and there was a um, a piece created called Making Treaty 7 that was about the signing of the land rights to that territory. Um, it was a project that brought together community artists with professional artists, and I think the most astounding achievement is just the indigenous artists that it's put on the radar for all of us in Calgary, and now those artists are starting to work on stages across Canada. Um, recently, uh, Making Treaty 7, which has formed its own cultural society and is continuing to create work, partnered with Quest Theatre, which is a TYA theatre company in Calgary that um, tours to classrooms across Alberta. And tied to um, uh, some support from the new curriculum, as David mentioned, they partnered with Treaty 7 to create a show that, bec that became like a touring TYA module of the Treaty 7 story. 
And so they, it was a collaboration between artists from the Making Treaty 7 Cultural Society and artists from Quest Theatre. And when I saw the play in a school gym, what impressed and excited me the most was how it did not at any point sugarcoat the story of the colonizing of the land in southern Alberta and the problematic signing of this treaty. Um, but it did, in fact, center the story around a friendship between two 11-year-old girls, one indigenous and one white, and posit that as a place for hope and future. So the group of uh, kids who were watching this show in the school gym, and this show toured, I think, over 50 places uh, just in the last six months alone, um, were just part of this story in a way that felt very joyful and educational and really, really empowering, um, while also being scary and lightning and, re and revealing and not holding back on those truths. So I had shared this project with David as an example of things happening in my region uh, that uh, had really been quite inspiring uh, to watch. So I offer that. Thanks, David. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So you've heard a lot about truth and reconciliation. The big word that I hear from indigenous artists and people is re reconciliation. Like, let's actually do something. In New Zealand, for Maori, the word is hui, that's meeting. So we often say there's too much hui and not enough dui. And uh, Justice Murray Sinclair said, education got us into this mess and education can get us out. And I think that is one of the things I would say that as indigenous people and non-indigenous, we are trying to get education going. And I wanted to actually ask Lisa, who is here, to talk about, she's actually done a course with Jill Carter, so I thought we'd talk about opportunities to train. Hi, uh, thank you so much for giving me this chance to uh, talk up Jill Carter. Um, so I took uh, Dr. Jill Carter's class uh, a couple of years ago. It was called, and it's still called, um, if this is your land, where are your stories? Um, Place-based dramaturgy. And it was a course on indigenous dramaturgy, not so much um, a how-to for dramaturgs to work uh, in and with indigenous communities as much as an exploration of how reading and centering indigenous work um, can really help non-indigenous people uh, question what they value as knowledge and what they value as um, a set structure. So I just wanted to uh, put her name in the room and say that if you are interested, I've found her to be a very generous uh, person, a very generous educator. Uh, she is cross-appointed at Indigenous Studies, the Center for Drama, Theater, and Performance Studies, and the Transitional Year Program at the University of Toronto. So you can find her bio and contact on any one of those um, web pages, also through the, International, the Indigenous Performing Arts Alliance web page. Um, and she ha I'm sure she'll have some lovely suggestions about um, plays to add to your curriculum if you are an educator that really help um, place land as and a knowledge of land as a central knowledge in a play text, which is not something a lot of works can do very well that we usually study. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a great way, um, at least I found, to encourage uh, students like myself to question what we see as knowledge um, and what we see as knowledge that needs to be shared and really question um, the idea that not everybody has a relationship with land and really foreground how we do have a relationship with land, we just might not be paying attention to it. So, yeah, so thank you. Although, if you got to go to the Smoking Gun Theatre, at lunchtime, what a great relationship with the land, having a solar-powered theatre. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So one of the things that I, like my reconciliation action, I was going to go to the elementary school of my children who are eight and 10. We have a thing in Canada called Orange Shirt Day. A girl called Phyllis who was at a, res at a residential school, she went to school with a orange shirt on and they said, get that off now. And they put her into the uniform and she never saw the orange shirt again. That is the story. It's printed on a little piece of paper 
I gave it to the teacher. I said, this is the day, and kids will be encouraged to wear orange T-shirts. And he replied, really? It could be a bit depressing. That was his response, right? So yesterday we talked about unsettling people. <laughs> That's what you have. So actually, I said, well, I could come in and do it. I don't mind. He was like, oh, no, I'll do it. It's okay. <laughs> But overall, I would say our, our elementary school, they, I get asked to come in and I say, look, I'm in a tricky position. I'm not even indigenous to this land, right? I'm indigenous from New Zealand. I'm also Ngāti Pākehā. I'm English, Scottish, Irish, mongrel, Canadian, New Zealander, Māori, right? I can help someone come in and talk about this. I can facilitate an elder, but I would rather pass the mic to someone else to do it. Right. I'll tell you a story about what happened in this elementary school when I brought the elder in. He was wearing his eagle headdress, but he was wearing like clothes just like you. He sat down, he was talking away like this, and his cell phone went off, and he went, sorry, kids. Oh, actually, yeah, I'm doing a presentation to some school kids. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, bye. And he proceeded, he told a lot of great stories. Afterwards, he had left, and the students had a feedback, and... One of them put up his hand and said, I've got a question. How come he's like a chief and he's got a mobile phone? And that was the question. And a lot of other kids went, yeah, that's right. How come? They just do not see indigenous people in the modern world. And that is one of the strongest stereotypes that you need to fight from Hollywood and things is that they exist in this past, right? How many people have seen Wonder Woman? What do you think of the Indian character? Right? All the great things Wonder Woman's doing, awesome. The Indian character, and if you're Scottish, right? Jeepers. <laughs> Drinking, uh, okay. Anyway, so it's a slow journey, but you kind of unsettle people a little bit at a time, right? Okay, next slide. I wanted to talk about a show, like uh, what I do know a reasonable amount is the Maori Theatre in New Zealand, and Taking shows out to the people, I think, is one. This is actually my friend, Rob Mokoraka. He wrote a show called Shot Bro. The story of Rob is pretty amazing. He was never diagnosed with depression. He just one day rang out the police and said, there is a guy outside in the street with a knife. I'm really worried. He then went into the kitchen and got a knife and ran out into the street. The police turned up. He threatened them, and they shot him. He had a massive operation. He was charged with, I think, attempted murder of a policeman. He went to court. He had been diagnosed by that stage. They plead his case. And he never actually went to prison. And he created a show from it. And he takes that show wherever he can to talk about depression. And the word that you won't understand there is koha. That means whatever you want to pay. That's a gift, right? It's free. You just go to the local town hall, the local gallery, or a marae where you are, and you see the show. Because for, especially for Māori guys, it's very hard to talk about your feelings, right? Um, it happens in a lot of cultures, particularly in cultures where the guys feel that they're not strong. It's even like the image of Māori is very strong, right? You think of people, strong, powerful, haka guys, right? That's your image. Or Māori from Moana, right? Huge, the rock. He's part Samoan. He's Polynesian. He's that kind of guy. He's always laughing. He can do Baywatch and get away with it, right? Almost. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, I talked about Zachariah, so I think we'll move on. And how many people have actually seen this film? Okay, so that would be, again, a model of indigenous work to transfer to uh, the theatre that would be useful. In terms of Māori ones, I would shout out for Taika Waititi, who made a film called Boy. He's part of uh, Flight of the Concords. He made uh, Hunt of the Wilder People. He's actually just directed Thor, Ragnarok. He... It's very interesting because he does not like people saying you're Māori first. He just says, I'm an artist. I'm a filmmaker. I happen to be Jewish and Māori from New Zealand, right? He doesn't like being identified that way first because it puts him in a pigeonhole, right? It ghettoizes, oh, 
You're going to make some angry thing, right? He makes Super Bowl ads. Like, in terms of evolution of Maori activist art, a lot of people would be saying, well, let's just be human, right? Let's not try and label us. That's one of the strongest things you'll get from that film, Real Engine 2, is that at the bottom line, Graham Greene, Adam Beach, they just say we'd like to do human stories. We don't want to just be the Indian, right? Or the Indian with a problem. Or the noble Indian. Or the wise Indian. Okay, next. Uh, anyone ever heard of this game? I thought I'd introduce one person. Two, yes, three. Great. So, a person to really follow is a woman called Dr. Elizabeth Laponte. I'm going to put her name. I'm going to give this PowerPoint to anyone who wants it, by the way. You don't have to write everything down. Isn't that the moment in the classroom where everyone just switches off? Right. Ah, oh, shit. I've been writing notes all this time, and now <laughs> he's just going to give me the power. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I've been paying attention. Okay, so never alone. Let's try and play it. Because gaming culture, in terms of access, a whole lot more indigenous people have access to gaming culture than they do the theatre generally. And that's where they're getting their stories from. <laughs> I think we need to be aware of the stories that are going on in the gaming world. There was a very long time where indigenous characters didn't appear. Assassin's Creed 3 had Mohawk in it. But how many people have heard of Custer's Revenge? So there is a game where Custer got his revenge by tying a Native American woman to a tree and raping her. That was how you won the game. That was your prize. The Gamergate culture attacked Elizabeth Laponce for saying that no one should be reviving Custer's Revenge because someone wanted to revive it. That is the kind of activism that she was involved in, right? And that's why we celebrate it when a game like Never Alone turns up because we can go, hey, you love gaming. Here's another game I can give to my nephew, my niece, my son. I can play myself or I can play with my children and they get a positive indigenous story, right? Okay, next. These are just some scenes from it. I'm sorry about the light. It's an amazingly beautiful game. And we'll skip this. This is Sherman Alexi on the Indi Indian novel. Skip. Skip. Okay, so if you're looking to buy a book, this is one that I am in, but I would also like to shout out all these names. You may know some of them. Tara is the person you saw earlier. Uh, Yvette Nolan has worked with LMDA for a long time, and she was actually one of the people who started 
one of the most powerful things that's happened in Canada in recent times, which was study, no, summit study repast. And we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, the article I wrote in this is actually called My Reconciliation Includes Just Dance. Does anyone know the game Just Dance? Where you yeah. I was doing Rihanna, Shine Like a Diamond. It's on New Year's Eve, and I went, why do I like doing this so much? And when can we get some indigenous songs into this? And I actually dawned on me that it is, um, for indigenous people, it's dance can seem a lot more n natural thing to go towards. And I think that's why in the musical that Corey wrote too, actual singing and dancing feels traditional. And that is actually something we've done for a long, long time about the land, for the land, with the land. And so musicals and dance actually feel very organically right. Okay, so that is uh, the book. That's the plug. Next. And I also wrote an article last time I was at LMDA in New York. I was with the Canadian thing and Spiderweb show, and I said, hey, we've got to do uh, stuff about truth and reconciliation. So Michael Wheeler turned around and said, okay, you, do it. <laughs> so I wrote an article, and I uh, used uh, Queens of the Stone Age, for those who know, 10 Feel Good Truth and Reconciliation Hits for the Summer. And I just wrote down the things that I thought you could do. Very simple things. Watch APTN, go to a powwow, read these books, join the round dance. And I, if we get a chance, we might go back to this. But this is actually a drum making workshop that I went to. This guy in the middle is Phil Hirondel. And he actually used the medicine wheel as a way of teaching. So are people familiar with the medicine wheel? So there is a movement in Canada now to use the medicine wheel as an educational tool to actually bring it into the curriculum. And it would be a great challenge to bring it in for dramaturgs as well. What if you take the medicine wheel and work, how can those work together? If we consider art as healing and the medicine wheel as healing, where is the connections between those things? Okay, next. Okay, so we got to J.K. Rowling, Adam Sandler, and I don't believe in cultural appropriation. I've put a lot on this one. How many people remember Ridiculous 6? Is it just gone, right? The news of Ridiculous 6 kind of just came and it's like, oh, that's terrible, it goes, right? It doesn't go for indigenous people. We remember that Adam Sandler made that movie that he created, he worked on a show that had a character called Beaver Breast. That he had an indigenous woman smoking a peace pipe and urinating, right? And it doesn't stop his career, right? It's just a blip. And I hear he's very good in a movie at Cannes. And now that Daniel Day-Lewis is retired, he probably feels he's going to get way more roles. But the people who walked off that movie... There were other indigenous actors who said they'd do the parts, right? That was the economic reality. Some went, yeah, I'm not doing this, and I'm telling the world about this movie. Other actors went, I need the money. Uh, the second one, how many people know the controversy about J.K. Rowling? So here was a chance for someone who was one of the most famous authors in the world to actually consult with indigenous people about what a skinwalker was, right? And she was challenged on it. She s just walked away. She just kind of went, nah, yeah, it was a thing that I found and I, it's not really what you guys are, actually it is. And there was a lot of people on the internet saying, I'll read it for you. <coughs> I'm uncomfortable with a white woman from Britain writing about skinwalkers or indigenous magic, where were there any consultants? Like, and she got a big silence back, right? So it happens, and we notice cultural appropriation a lot, but it becomes normalized, right? And the other one is actually what happened in Canada just recently with Wright magazine, where the editor got a whole lot of indigenous people to write articles, and then wrote in his editorial that he didn't believe in cultural appropriation. 
and then qualified it later that it was a Swiftian kind of satire. And he got a, like, a lot of uh, feedback, and he resigned. So cultural appropriation is a big controversy ongoing that we constantly monitor. Okay, next. Okay, I'm actually going to ask Brian Quirt to get a mic. Have you got a mic, Brian? <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Um, so the National Arts Center in Ottawa, uh, for those of you who don't know, is um, Lincoln Center-like, Kennedy Center-like, national institution in classical disciplines. In the English theater department, um, several years ago, they committed to a multi-year study exploration of the indigenous body of work by indigenous performance makers in Canada. Uh, and it took uh, uh, three um, units of time over three years, two and a half years really, uh, the summit, uh, which I was able to attend at their in invitation, and then a, a double-barreled one called the study and then the repast. Um, the summit, uh, place over three days at the Banff Center in um, uh, just west of Calgary on the territory of the Blackfoot, Shona Nakoda, and the Chukchina um, nations. It was three days, uh, about thir between 30 and 40 people, um, organized by the National Arts Center, but ultimately organized by members of the indigenous performance community, particularly by Yvette Nolan, uh, uh, representing those communities, and Sarah Stanley representing the Arts Center, Sarah Stanley, who's a board member of LDBA, by the way, and um, over the course of three days, the goal was to explore and um, voice the, the as fullest possible extent of the indigenous body of creation of the last 30, 40, 50 plus years, to name them, to list them, to catalog them, to acknowledge them, to discuss them, and through that process to discuss the, the breadth of indigenous performance in Canada historically to honor those who have created work for the past uh, and to honor uh, many of the works that even those communities have forgotten. Uh, as part of the process, what the organizers did was, in addition to a group of indigenous artists from across the country, they invited a group of uh, witnesses. Uh, and I was in that uh, component of it. Uh, individuals who uh, either led or were part of large organizations or organizations that were allies or uh, institutions or um, uh, uh, people who were part of these communities were but were not indigenous themselves. And uh, our the invitation was to attend but to not speak, literally to be a witness to this process, this set of conversations over these three days, uh, but to not speak. Uh, all all of the full day discussions and sessions happened with everyone there in a circle. Uh, there was smudging in the morning. Uh, there was a, a usually a ritual or a ceremony at the beginning of each day with music. And then a series of discussions exploring this body of work. Um, the privilege of being there was really quite extraordinary. And while I can't speak for the impact of the indigenous um, participants and what it was like for them, of course, to have us there but be silent, but I can only imagine it was a huge relief, if nothing else. Um, but what was beautiful about it on many levels was that um, they could have had that conversation, uh, and I'm sure many were tempted to have that conversation with, without us. They did not need us to have that conversation to create that um, body of knowledge that is available on the National Arts Center website, and I urge you to look it up. It's just documents of the summit, but also the other components of it, uh, very thoroughly, very effectively in several voices, uh, not just indigenous voices, but other organizers as well. But from a witness's point of view, the, the power of it was um, uh, uh, multi-leveled, and David asked me to reflect on it, which has been really kind of fantastic over the last day or so. Um, it, it urged us and made me um, uh, listen better and hear more. It uh, enabled me to hear new voices amongst those who are gathered from the indigenous communities uh, very clearly and very effectively. It um, uh, enabled me to hear the voices of many long-term colleagues uh, that I've known and or worked with for many years in indigenous communities, the 
hear their voices uh, fresh, unmediated by either my own or my other non-Indigenous colleagues' um, voices. It um, uh, enabled us as witnesses and me as an individual to see and hear the nuances of those communities. They represented communities from across the country. They are not all the same. They are not all in agreement. There are many um, uh, uh, nuances in how the various Indigenous communities across the disciplines work together or do not work together. Uh, and to be able to be um, an observer and a witness to um, how they, what the happened when they came together to speak about their work was really quite remarkable. Um, and then as Diane Brewer said the other day, uh, in terms of um, listening in a conversation and what it did when, in a, over three days being asked not to speak at all in any of the sessions, did partly what you were, or addressed partly what you were speaking to, Diane, was uh, we were, as a result, we got out of a habit, at least I got out of a habit, of framing my response. Uh, I didn't have to have a response. They weren't interested in my response. They were interested in my presence. And to be valued for your presence and not your voice is something um, that we will all benefit from. I, if you were able to partake of an experience like that, I, I recommend it. Because our presence is valuable, but our voices are often sadly the problem. And um, by uh, compelling us to not show off, to not show how much we knew, to not um, articulate that we had knowledge that uh, should impress them, uh, that we were there to absorb whatever we could or would, and how much we did did not matter to them. Our presence mattered to them. On the final day, they did have one session at the very end where um, those who were witnesses, if they so wished, were invited to speak and reflect on the experience if they wanted to, if we wanted to. And part of what was fascinating is that most did not, that the invitation to be there as witness carried through right to the end. Several people did, uh, absolutely, uh, and they often voiced reflections very similar to what I'm doing right now, but what was the experience of listening deeply to voices that aren't listened to enough? Thanks, David. Two forty-two. Okay, so then uh, we talked about reconciliation quite a bit. There was a. Uh, if we just have the next slide, I think we talked about Kevin Loring yesterday. So we might. You. This will be on the PowerPoint. Keep going, and we did Tara. Oh, the pipeline project. I wanted to highlight a few projects. This was a really interesting play. Obviously, one of the biggest things people think colonialism. Oh yeah, it happened way back in the eighteen hundreds. The pipelines are the new colonialism, right? The pipelines are going everywhere, and we're fighting them all the time. So the pipeline project was Kevin, Sebastian, and Columbia Sparrow all creating. It was kind of a political skit show, but at the end, they actually had an expert come and speak, and it was great. And the audiences hung around, and they really wanted to know what the expert experts said. There were First Nations experts. There were scientists, there were politicians. It was a great way to get debates going. Okay, next one. <coughs> so Home by David Diamond and Renee Morris. That was another great show that I saw this year in Vancouver. And this was like a half hour show, but Forum Theatre, and then they did the show again, and the audience could jump up and be in the show and take over parts in moments of conflict. I'm not sure how many people have seen that kind of theater, but it was scary, right? Extremely scary. And that's why it was booked out during the season, but they had to, at the end of the show, say, please tell people to come because lots of people have found out what this show is and they're not turning up. They do not want to be confronted with, you could be in the show. But the amazing thing that happened on the night that I was there was a young uh, First Nations woman wanted to be in the show so much she got up twice to be in these moments. One was a story of a child who had been scooped and brought up in a white family, and another was a business one. It was a really powerful, engaging form of theatre, so I wanted to shout out to them. And David Diamond also did a great thing. He said, everyone's talking about truth and reconciliation as though it's one thing. It means a whole lot of different things, but it 
he said there's one thing that happens is that white settler societies have to have a reconciliation of their own about what happens. And if you think about a film like Spotlight, there's a thing where the church and the government and the cops and everybody has to work out a reconciliation of what happened there. Indigenous people have their own things going on. There was a hell of a lot of lateral violence in indigenous communities. Abuse. It is tough to be in that society at times. If you've seen a movie, the Maori film, Once Were Warriors, it addresses that thing. We ne have to have reconciliation, and it, but it happens within indigenous communities. It's just for indigenous communities. Then there is a third sort, which is between the two. So that was a really kind of mind-opening thing for me, to go, actually, you can break it into a whole lot of different forms. Okay, next. Uh, this is Justin Many Fingers and Brian Solomon. I wanted to do a shout-out for them because these guys are dancers, theatre guys, and they both are missing fingers on their hands. They were both born like that. They're two-spirited, without hands, uh, and indigenous. And their show is hysterically funny. And they talk about when they were kids how they did jokes like during shop when they got a substitute teacher. They got the ketchup poured all over their hand and then made out as though they'd got their fingers sawed off just to freak the, su the substitute teacher out. <laughs> yeah. And they actually, for part of their research, they recorded their mothers to go, what was it like to have a child who's born and then realize they weren't perfect, that they were missing parts. And their mothers did these amazing monologues which they thought they would use as research, but when they played them in the room, they went, that's the soundtrack of the show. It was about how much their mothers loved them. And something that Brad was talking about, they allowed you to stare, and then they stared back, and it was like, look at me, just see me. Here I am. This is how I am. This is my hand or not. And it's a very, very powerful activist show, but it's done in a beautiful dance way. And the night that I was there, this they got tripped up on the bike, so it had an extra trickster quality. Next. And uh, reality TV, right? You don't really think about it in terms of activism. Michael, Kenners, are you here? We talked about reality TV. I said, you got to, next time we have a conference, I'm talking about it. Because that is something people have access to, right? This is a show on Aboriginal People's Television Network. It's called Moose Meat and Marmalade. It is a British chef, Dan Hayes, and a Cree Bush chef called Art Napoleon. He's an amazing musician. He does Cree covers of like Credence Clearwater Revival and bands like that. And he gets, it gets a lot of good political stuff out there in a way that people can handle it because it's a cooking show, right? And that is one of the subtle, interesting things about our indigenous societies, the trickster, right? We managed to fit things in where you didn't quite see them. So I thought I'd do a shout out for that. You can watch it on uh, uh, demand, I think. Uh, next. Uh, this is another show that I've been involved in. It's called Rezo. And I put up I Am Married to a River. George Bellavo and Janice Valdez uh, work in, at UBC. They're not indigenous, but one of the big problems, as I'm sure you're aware, is water. And one of the people who went to Standing Rock said to me, don't ever call me a protester, right? We are protectors of water. And water is sacred. And one of the big problems around the world is with for engineering is that they have mach the designs that they can plonk into a community that will make the water clean but they don't have people who can deal with the nation to tell them how to use it and do it in a respectful cultural way so that it keeps getting used properly, right? So they went to the communities to actually get stories about water and actually go, what is water to you? How can we make this part of your culture to have a water purifying system or a filter in there? And uh, my story was I am married to a river because I lost my wedding ring in a river. And my wife's still crying about that. Okay, next. Uh, I was going to do a whole lot of shout-outs. Thomas King got mentioned yesterday. If you want to find out more about Indigenous artists, IPAA has a lot. Daryl Dennis is a great 
writer who an actor he's got peace pipe dreams it's, uh eleanor are you here you work at native voices at the Autry, don't you so i'm going to now ask you if you would you like to talk you don't have to but yeah no i want you to i only just found out today okay hi hi can you hear me hello oh, here we go hi i'm eleanor timmon i just finished at the tail end of a project working at uh, Native Voices, which is at the Autry Museum of the, can you hear me? Yeah, a yeah, little Autry Museum of the American West, which is in Los Angeles. And for those of you who don't know about this project, every year they have a festival uh, that supports and develops the work of uh, Native American playwrights. And they normally have about three works that are in development and each playwright and play gets assigned a director, a dramaturg, and a company of performers, as well as designer. And we have a retreat, about a 10-day intensive retreat, where we all hunker down and work on the, work on the script. And at the end, there is a semi-staged reading for the public, both at the Autry and this year was also at La Jolla. Uh, and so I was one of three dramaturgs working on one of the plays. I am non-Indigenous, so there are lots of questions that come up with my presence on a project like that. Um, and that's something I'd actually really love to address a little further, but I don't know if we, ha we have time. Uh, you can address it right now. Yeah, it was a question that you actually raised at the beginning, which was about uh, non-Indigenous dramaturgs working on Indigenous projects, right? You raised that, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah. So, what was I doing on this project? Should I have even been on the project? I mean, I have that question myself. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, did I support the development of the play? Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, was I the best dramaturg for that project? I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if that's something I should continue to do in the future. So. It's a very um, complicated question. I think it's a case-by-case case thing for me, um, but maybe it's a question for the playwright as well um, to respond to. Unfortunately, he is not here. Um, but it is a, a, a fraught question. I wonder if there are any dramaturgs, including non-Indigenous in the room, who have a response. Yes. Do you want Hi. I'm Jane Wenger, and I uh, directed a play that is still touring uh, in Alaska and in the Athabascan community about teen suicide uh, in the male community, and uh, as well as directing an opera about the Ashland uh, culture here in San Francisco two years ago. So I can't ask, I can't answer that question, but I agree with you in raising it. And I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. And what I learned from working as a dramaturg um, or a director in these cases was how little I know. Yeah. And what I learned was how to ask questions. And I learned a huge amount about giving up my preconceived notions of what I, what I knew and what I thought I knew. So when I learned things like, um, from a young man, I can't do that dance. My grandma says I can't do that dance with the Nanukiat. We don't do that if we're Athabascan. Old Jane would have said, well, screw your grandma, we're doing the dance, you know? But not really that. But new Jane learned to say, why don't you bring your grandma in to tell us what we can and can't do and how do we work it all together? And that's just one of 30 things I learned about how much I didn't know. Yeah, right, so the, the not knowing question comes up again. The dramaturg is the one who, who doesn't know in the room. Uh, and I, you know, in this particular experience that I had, um, I was constantly in a position of having to play catch up with the rest of the members of the company, trying to educate myself in this project. So I, I needed them to wait for me very often and to, to very graciously up with my not knowing and trying to educate myself. So it was a very delicate dance 
Uh, but yeah, it's the not knowing and being okay with not knowing and have everyone in the room being okay with you not knowing uh, is, is what seems to be the question. I think sometimes we happen to be there for a multitude of reasons. And, and I think there without a doubt would have been a better uh, tutored drama clerk than myself, but maybe I was best for that project at that moment. I just wanted to echo uh, my agreement of, of the last two speakers. Um, I, uh, I produced a Native American theater festival some years ago um, and found myself in the role of dramaturg. Um, and I agree that uh, entering into uh, an indigenous project as a non-indigenous person, um, the, the amount, first of all, the objectives of our festival, of course, at a university were largely cultural and educational. And so that framework, I think, um, is a little more forgiving, perhaps. Um, I cannot tell you the amount of learning that every single non-Indigenous person who uh, experienced this festival had. It really is one of my most extraordinary experiences in the theater. We, through the organization Amarinda in New York City, we connected with two indig indigenous playwrights uh, from the Haudenosaunee uh, group of tribes, uh, Eric Vansworth and Vicky Ramirez, who are the playwrights. Uh, Steve Elm was the director. Uh, but as part of the festival, we brought in the Spider Woman Theater, uh, and uh, Gloria Miguel uh, performed a one woman piece that she had been writing. One of her sisters came. Uh, we brought in a couple of indigenous actors to work with our undergraduate students. Uh, the learning was extraordinary. They, uh, they smudged with our students, they danced with them. Uh, the, the, the traditions were extraordinary. I've never learned more. And I think just being sensitive, respectful, and uh, the sort of, um, I served as host more than dramaturg. I, I felt that I was, I was really the liaison um, for this experience. And as long as I understood that and, and they understood that, it, it, was, it was an amazing experience. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. I don't know, can you hear me? Okay, hi, I'm Wesley Ishii, she, her, hers. Um, I've been working with Alaska Natives, I, and I first I have to start out. I say this as a very humble, um, self-educating ally, and I feel it my purpose in the arts to be um, uh, an ally. Uh, so I do ally building wh wherever I can, whenever I can. And so in working with Alaska Natives and uh, with the Perseverance Theater, and then um, also being brought on to Dramaturg, a piece this coming season at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, um, I absolutely see myself as a diversity, inclusion, equity liaison, where I'm urging, and, and my new boss <laughs> here is, is getting that I am insisting on protocol and um, that practice, and that when we go to meet and have um, a, a, a relationship building moment to ask permission. I have found in my past experience with the Hopi Nation that I am not there to convince them of my artistic choices. I'm there to listen and I am there to basically uh, absorb in a very humble way a deep transmission of cultural exchange. And it's actually really helping me to learn what a true collaborative process is. So I just encourage you to keep learning about protocol and um, whatever I can do to support uh, the indigenous artists to have and honor their way of life. I'm not there to interrupt theirs. I'm there to support way of life and our collaboration. Right. Kat? Hey, y'all. Um, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, I guess riffing off of some of the things that have already been said. I'm j I just came off of um, a residency at the Kimmel uh, through Jake Pog, um, working with a black and native uh, woman playwright. 
um, and so this is something that's been on my mind. And I, I just want to um, say that leading with listening uh, is so important. And then, yes, it is the, the role of the dramaturg to ask questions, right? It's something that we do to be able to um, uh, ask really pointed, specific questions that'll f the f you know further the work. But I think it's also really important to make the distinction between questions that we're asking for ourselves and question that we're asking for the playwright and in service of the story that they're telling. So is this a question that we need to, you know, go to the library, <laughs> do some self-education, you know, or, or uh, kind of uh, aggregate, you know, w okay, I don't know about this, I don't know about that, I don't know about this. And of course, recognizing that the, the person that we're working with that, you know, who may be outside of our experience is a body of knowledge as well, right? And has a certain expertise. And so maybe it's, holding those questions and then, you know, doing some mini-turgy in your mind and kind of figuring out what is the big question, right, that I need to ask that will point me in the direction to continue that education on my own time, right, versus stopping for every little thing that one doesn't get, um, I think is, is really important. I also just want to throw into the mix that um, in many indigenous cultures, um, you know, as a Latina myself and like my, uh, my father being from Nicaragua, uh, many indigenous communities have a completely different conception of time, um, you know, experience, uh, you know, just literally everything about the way the world works and how we walk through it. Uh, and so just not Im imposing a Western understanding of all of those things because what seems confusing or murky for us uh, as Westerners may be highly intentional um, on, on you know their part. Uh, and uh, lastly, I'll say that in approaching uh, a work or a writer, again, anyone who falls outside of the experience, especially when we're talking about min minoritarians, um, to anticipate and welcome um, resistance, uh, I think is really important. Um, you know, everything is context. We don't live in a vacuum. And to be able to check our own privilege and say, you know, it. It might be me, but it's also bigger than me. So to depersonalize parts of the process, and uh, I can't, I can't, y'all, I can't even be mad. <laughs> like you know, ain't nobody got time for that. So just to really respect and empathize and grow alongside of the people that we're working with. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna have to finish the session. Can I? I'm gonna invoke a bit of protocol. We're gonna make a circle to end with. So if everyone comes out of the chairs and make a circle around the chairs. We're going to have a final sealing of the deal, Haka. So form a circle around all the chairs. Kerry, thank you very much. You're going to put the Haka up. If you look at the screen, coming up. Oh, the side can't be reached. No, no, not, no, no. Go back to the PowerPoint and keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And back up, back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. There, stop. Okay, that guy, the chief. Next one. We're going to do Taraprahar's Haka. That's the one you see the All Blacks do. That was appropriated by the New Zealand rugby team from a chief. The Court of Appeal would not allow the Ngāti Toa to take it back and own it. They said it belonged to all of New Zealand. So the tribe said, okay, but you're going to do it properly. Okay? So... There he is. I can tell you some more about him, but we'll go to the words next, Kerry. So the words, the next page, sorry. So all you have to remember is kamate, kamate, kaura, kaura. Say that. And don't worry about the next part because I'll say it. Tene te tanata puhuru huru na 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 tiki mai whakawhiti te ra. The next part you will do. A upane. Kaupane, aupane, kopane, fiti te ra. So he was trapped underground because he was running for his life and he hid in a pit. So he thought he was going to die. Tis death, tis death. Then the people above him said, Go, I think we can save your life. And he, the man who saved him was a hairy man, a chief. And that meant he thought he would live again. So he. The translation is, who brought the sun and caused it to shine. A step up, another step up, a step up, another, the sun shines. And I see that for indigenous people as being a metaphor for 
We've suffered in the dark a long time, but now we're stepping towards the light. Okay, so now I'm going to drop the mic. Not really. I invite, I invite everyone to uh, just stay in the circle for uh, a minute uh, for a few more announcements. I know we have had some uh, new people um, come join us today. So my name is Ken Cornelia, he, him, his. I am president of 